good morning and welcome you to our second service. We, in our first service this morning, we honored our, our graduates, our high school and college graduates, and we had a lot of them and, and their families. But we're glad you're here for the second service. In just a second, one of our college graduates, Jordan Hoffman, is going to lead our singing and, and music today. So if you'll join right in as, as he leads us, would you uh, join me in prayer as we ask God's blessing on our time together? Father, it is good to be in your house and to be with your people and to be reminded of your goodness and faithfulness. And we pray that our hearts would be filled with gratitude and trust and awe of who you are and what you've done for us. And we pray that our worship would be pleasing to you through Christ. We thank you for your steady hand on our lives. And we pray as we uh, gather here today that our minds could be focused upon you and that our hearts would be warmed with love for Christ as a result of being in this service. And we thank you for your presence here among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys. I'm going to ask you guys to stand as we sing. And I'm not Eric, so that means I'm probably not going to hit every single note and I might be a little offbeat. But for this first song, I'm singing it a little different. So if you want to just listen to the first verse, I expect you guys to pick it up on the second though. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hail of salvation, purchase of God. Born in His spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. better than the first service. is my 
Father in heaven, we thank you that you provide for our every need. We thank you that as individuals and as families that we can say our cup runs over. Thank you for your provision of the past week and even as we give in this moment, we are dependent upon you for this upcoming week and the challenges and the problems that we face. We look to you to provide for us this week and we give back now a portion of what you blessed us with and pray you'll bless it to extend your kingdom in Jesus' name. song we're going to sing together this morning is about heaven and as uh, Jordan leads us in that I wanted to read from Revelation 21 then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more and 
I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is God's word. Not sure if you guys picked up on that tune, but it was what a day that will be. So I'm going to let you guys sit down, but uh, sing out. There is coming a day when no hard day shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tear to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day! Glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And he takes me by the hand, leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There will be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face one who saved me by his grace and he takes me by the hand leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be what a day glorious day that will be see you. Good to, good to have Carrie with us today, Carolyn, and uh, sorry on your first day back in a while. I'm getting this close close to you. It's good to have you with us today, brother. Sorry I'm up, up this close, but I wanted to, to come down uh, today and just talk to you for a few minutes about the subject of assurance, if we can get the slide uh, to work. You'll have to click twice. I'll have to click twice, okay? I don't know if I know how to click even once, but there we go. So uh, what I want to talk about today is the subject of assurance. And as we uh, think about being, being a Christian, I, I remember when I prayed to, to become a Christian, when I asked God to save me, and at the moment I got up from prayer, the pastor who led me to faith in Christ said, do you, do you know for sure that you're saved? And in that moment, I had this sense in my heart that God had saved me. But sometimes along life's journey, sometimes we can struggle with a sense of assurance. And so that's what, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, and I want to talk about how sometimes it's, it's uh, life can, can hit you in such a way that you begin to doubt if you really are a Christian. So I want, to, I want to talk about that today, though it's not really a sermon. So if we could go to the next slide, or maybe I can go to the next slide. We'll see how this works. Um, click it twice. No, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave singing. Y'all don't want that either. Um, there we go. Assurance. Keep going. This is a wonderful thing. All right, so here's the verse. For those of you who are visiting with us, we've been working our way through 1 John. And in 1 John, uh, there's a verse we're going to get to in chapter 5. This is 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, where John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God.
God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And so this is, a, this is a verse, as you can see, that John, he doesn't use the word assurance, but it's clear this is what he's talking about. He's writing to Christians, and he wants them to have this settled confidence in their hearts that they, are, that they have eternal life, that they're saved. And so the whole letter, as we've been seeing, the whole letter is written for this, this purpose. This is in chapter 5, so if you go back, we've been doing this on uh, Sunday mornings, and these are some of the things he's, he tells us that if these signs or indicators or marks are present in our lives, these are, these are ways we can understand that we really are saved. So, for example, in chapter 1, he talks about walking in the light. God himself is light. That's God's character. And if we really know God, that will show up in our lives. We'll be walking in the light. Um, we'll be concerned about holiness. We'll be growing in a Christ-like way. He also talks about confessing our sins. A true Christian is someone who doesn't cover up their sins, but they practice ongoing confession of sin. That's 1 John 1, 9. Uh, we've also read a lot in 1 John about obedience to God's commands, that a genuine believer is certainly not perfect in their obedience to God's commands because we fall short uh, of a perfect standard, but we have a heartfelt desire to do what God's Word tells us, right? If we're really born of God, we want to do the things that are pleasing to Him, and so we obey His command. That's a sign that we're really a Christian. Uh, the fourth thing on the slide there is a genuine love for the brethren. In chapter 3, he talks about how we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. How do you know that you pass from spiritual death into spiritual life? He says we know this because we have a love for other Christians. We're to love all people as God's children, but we have a particular or special love for people in the family of God. We have a spiritual bond with people who also know Jesus. And then the last kind of mark or indicator that he talks about throughout the book, this is a way you can know you're a Christian, is your confession about Jesus. Who do you say that Jesus really was? Who do you say that Jesus is? And so Christians confess that Jesus is the, the Messiah, that he's the Savior of, of the world. But the point here is that John is writing in chapter 5 saying, I write these things to you so that you may know that assurance, you may have confidence that you have eternal life. And so if we honestly examine our lives and we see some of the things he's writing about here present in our lives, God is wanting us to have assurance. So before I go any further, though, I want to talk just a moment about a couple of very important uh, points. Uh, one is the thing of uh, false assurance. It is possible, I'm talking today primarily about having a confidence, if you're a Christian, having the settled assurance that you belong to God, that you're on your way to heaven. But it is possible for certain people to have a false assurance. Jesus said at, on the last day that many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons. In your name we perform many wonderful works. And what, is, what does Jesus say will happen? He will say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. So it's possible for people to go through life thinking that they are Christians, assuming that they're, they're going to heaven. And Jesus says on the last day, if they didn't know Jesus, heaven is not their home. And so it's possible to go through life with a false sense of assurance. And so it's important for us to examine our lives according to the scripture. The other thing I would uh, issue before we go forward is this thing of self-examination. Um, if we're trying to have assurance in our lives, it's important for us to have a certain level of self-examination. The Bible actually tells us here, you see this passage in 2 Corinthians, to examine ourselves, to test ourselves, to see whether we are in the faith. And so it's important for us, if we're trying to, if we struggle with assurance, it's important for us to kind of look inwardly to make sure we really are saved. The Bible talks about making your calling and election sure. This is the most important thing to settle in your life, and so it's important to examine yourself. But here's a caution I would issue to all of us, especially to me. Sometimes I can be overly introspective. Anybody else like that? There's this tension in the Bible. God calls upon us to examine ourselves. We should have healthy self-examination, but sometimes we can look too much inward. We can 
practice introspection and examination so much that we look so much inside ourselves that we're no longer looking to Jesus. And if you're struggling with assurance and you're constantly trying to, to see those signs I talked about earlier, do I really confess sin? Am I walking in the light? If we look so much inwardly for those signs that our faith doesn't grow at all because we're looking at ourselves instead of looking at Jesus, if that makes sense. So I, I, am, I am prone to this. I have to watch this myself. I, I, I need to examine my life, but I can't constantly be doing it. Does that make sense? Give me the holy head bob if that makes some sense. If it doesn't, then just do this, okay? So we do have to examine our life, test ourselves to see if we're in the faith, but we can't be constantly testing ourselves. We have to look honestly at what the Bible says and look honestly at our lives. So, again, I want to talk about assurance primarily for people here today that might be struggling with assurance as a Christian. And I want to talk real quickly about some factors that can hinder your assurance as a Christian. So I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but let's just, for argument's sake, say everybody here is a Christian. But inwardly, you might say to yourself, if we were having a, you might say to me if we are having a conversation, you know, sometimes I, I wonder if I'm really going to heaven. And I, I want to talk about some reasons why you might struggle with assurance, okay? So here's the things I'm going to walk through uh, real quickly this morning. So first of all, our home life is really important. What I mean here especially is how you were raised as, as a child in those formative years. The second thing we'll talk about is the teaching you're exposed to at a place like, like Bethel or the church you, you came from. The third thing we'll talk about is experience of affliction or hardships and how those hard times in life can get you to question if God really loves you or if you belong to him. The fourth thing we'll talk about is when we sin as Christians, sometimes that blocks the sunshine of God's love. We don't feel that he loves us when we sin as Christians, so we'll talk about that. And then the final thing is spiritual warfare. The devil doesn't want you to have assurance as a Christian. So those are the things I'm going to talk about real quickly uh, today, if you'll be patient with me. So let me talk about this just for a few minutes, some things related to home life and your upbringing. So as a, as a child especially, you know, we, we don't think about this all the time, but as I have five children, and I have to be reminded that those five children in my house, their worldview is being formed from the time they're born. What I mean by worldview is that that's the way we see the world. Everybody has a worldview, and a worldview is, is kind of like the lens through which you see life. It's how you view yourself. How do you view yourself? How do you view other people? How do you view, view God? That's a person's worldview. And so everybody has a worldview, and their worldview as children is being formed from the earliest age. And so um, they're answering, they're getting questions answered of those big questions in life. We talk about this quite often in church, life's ultimate questions or life's inescapable questions like, is there a God? If so, what is this God like? Is there life after death? Is there, uh, you know, is there right and wrong? And who decides what's right and wrong? All those big questions that we all wrestle with in life, children are getting some of those answers to those questions in the home by what they see in our lives as parents or as, or as grandparents, right? And think the third thing I've got on the slide here is about imitation because children learn a whole lot, not only about what we say about these things, but they learn by, by watching our example, right? So people learn by imitating us, and so they learn by imitating their parents. And so their worldview is being formed, remember, what they believe about themselves, what they believe about other people, most importantly, what they believe about God, that's being formed in those early years in the home. So, from a negative standpoint, we're talking about assurance today. So, from a negative standpoint, what could happen is if a child has an overbearing father, a over-demanding father, it could be that when that child grows up and becomes a Christian, they could project that same kind of overbearing father to God as father. Does that make sense? So if the, the, the father was abusive, would be another way of talking about it. If the father was abusive, and later in life this child becomes a Christian, it's going to be really hard for that child to overcome and, and not project that kind of abuse to the heavenly father, if that makes sense. I'm not saying we could blame that father forever, but it's, it's 
and you can't overcome it, but I am saying it's really hard for a person because their, their view of God in those formative years was shaped by their, their imperfect dad. Does that make sense? I need to quit asking you if that makes sense. Sorry. Um, so home life is really important. So if you had a very troubled home life, it could be if you still struggle with assurance, it's related to your past, okay? All right, next thing is what happens at church related to, to teaching. So in the 1700s, there was a man that preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. His name was Jonathan Edwards. It uh, took place in 1741, and God used this sermon, which was all about judgment. God used this sermon to start a great awakening in America, where literally thousands and thousands of people were saved. And so Jonathan or Edwards preached this sermon to his church, and scores of people came to Christ, and that started this great awakening. And it was a sermon, that, like I just mentioned, it's all about judgment. I mean, look at the title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And so that we need to preach this, right? We need to preach that God is a God of justice. God is a God of judgment. God will not simply look over or sweep sin under the rug. God does bring about justice and judgment in the world. However, what if this was the only kind of preaching you were ever exposed to? Don't misunderstand me. I just said we should preach sermons like this about God's judgment on sin, but what if you can't, you went to a church and that's all, all the, the message you, you ever heard was God is a God of judgment, God is a God of justice, God is a God who's going to punish sin. God will punish sin, he is a God of judgment, but there's much more to the character of God, isn't there? We read a whole lot about God's love in the Bible, right? So if you came to a church where consistently you had this message pounded into you that God's going to judge you in your sin. God's going to judge you. God's a God of justice. One day there's a day of reckoning, and you never heard the other side also, which is God is also a God of love. God is a God of, of grace. And if that's what your experience is in church, and you couple that with that home life, remember, we just talked about, and your view of God in this sense of assurance can be really impacted in a negative way. So what you hear at church in terms of your, and having assurance as a Christian, it really, it really matters, okay? Yeah, I'm not going to spend equal time on all these, but this is one that we all can relate to, I think. When we think about our sense of assurance and having this settled confidence that God really loves me, that I really belong to God, that's what assurance is. Sometimes hard times hit in your life and you begin to wonder, is, is, is God for me or against me? Can I get a witness? You know, think bad things happen like Job's life. These series of things, these heavy things happen in, in Job's life. And Job, who was a righteous man, when you read the book of Job, what happens? He begins to question, doesn't he? As a man of faith, he begins to ask out loud, hey, is God for me or is he actually against me? And he begins to actually say, it'd be better off if I was never even born. That's how hard times were for Job. Or you think of a place like Psalm 42, where we have the questions uh, the psalmist asks, where he says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why, why are you disquieted within me? Or why are you in turmoil on the inside? That doesn't sound like a person of, of faith that has assurance, does it? It sounds like somebody that's really struggling to have this sense, this confidence that God is for them. They belong to God. So in some ways, it's natural for us to go through life sometimes and to question or have struggles about our sense of assurance. And you may be, you, you may have come through a series of things in your, in your own life. You know, one thing right after another, early in your life, maybe you had a sense of assurance, you knew you belonged to God and God loved you, but life has been so hard for you in recent years, maybe you're struggling with assurance now. And so in some ways, I would say that's, that's natural. But notice how the, the psalmist is is fighting the fight of faith. On the inside, things are not right, but he's still battling to have faith in God. He's trying to get to that place of assurance again, right? So home life is really important. What you hear in church consistently is important on terms of your assurance, and sometimes life itself can impact or hinder your assurance as a Christian and God's love for you. Um, I probably should skip over this. This is a very long quote. I think I will. 
but basically I'm quoting somebody else here who says, you know, sometimes as Christians, our assurance can be impacted when we, we willfully sin. In other words, Christians aren't perfect people. We talked about that a lot recently. We confess our sins. But if, if I am guilty of a sin as a Christian and I remain unrepentant and I'm not coming clean with God and I just keep on doing it, then it's likely I'm not going to have a sense of God's favor and blessing in my life. It doesn't mean that I no longer have a relationship with Him. It doesn't mean He separates me from Him, that He cuts me off. But it does mean that I'm going to lack a sense of God's favor and blessing if I'm remaining unrepentant. Does that make sense? Or I said it again. Be because God, in His goodness, is not going to allow me to continue in that sin. And so I have a sense of His displeasure. I'm going to lack a certain amount of assurance if I continue to live in a pattern of, of sin. And so sin itself, when we sin as Christians, if we don't come clean, and repent and confess our sins and we're living in it for a time that can impact your assurance and that's actually a good thing see how long that was I spared you all right now the last thing I'll talk about is spiritual warfare I know that you know this is real but to remind you the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against spiritual wickedness in high places and so the devil has his bag of tricks, his schemes, um, and he is out for each one of us. And I just want to remind you, what, what was his original tactic all the way back in Genesis chapter 3? God had created Adam and Eve. They enjoyed fellowship with God every day of their lives. They walked with God in fellowship in the cool of the day. And then Satan comes in Genesis chapter 3 and... and They've been told one thing, remember, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of this, you'll surely die. And what does Satan do? He comes and he questions what God has said, but he also questions the goodness of God. Remember? He's questioned, his tactic for Adam and Eve to get them to sin is to question God's word, but also to question the goodness of God. God's withholding something good from you. So my point is, is that Satan hasn't changed the way he works. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness. And so the devil continues to tempt Christians to question God's word and to question the goodness of, of God and God's love for you. And so it, it's, it seems natural then, if we talk about the subject of assurance and Christians having this confidence that they're really on their way to heaven that the devil could mess with that in your life. That he could bring about intense spiritual warfare to cause you to doubt that you are a Christian when you really are a believer. And so we talk about these five things, and sometimes it's not just one of these things. It's not just your home life. It's not just what you hear in, in church growing up or maybe even this church. It's not, you know, you know just, uh, what was the third thing? It's not just afflictions. It's not just... Uh, any of these things individually, sometimes all these things converge together and you find yourself, yourself in a place as a Christian where you're like, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I, I want to have assurance, but I really struggle to have a confidence that I, that I have eternal life. And so if, if that's you today, I just want you to know that you're, you're not an abnormal Christian. Remember, we've been working our way through 1 John, and 1 John is written, why? He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so it's obvious, even those early Christians, some of them struggled with a sense of assurance. Otherwise, John wouldn't need to write, write the letter. So some of these things could be true in your life. It's going back to your home life or hard times, and so... God can work with you wherever you are to give you a greater sense of assurance. The devil wants you to question the goodness of God and also question God's word, to doubt God's word. But God's word says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So being a Christian, is, it's not that we're hoping. I'm hoping that in the end I'll finally be saved. No, a Christian can have a settled 
confidence that we really know Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it, it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus yeah. promises eternal life to every person that trusted him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that promise? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord from from your heart, the best way you know how, whoever you are, confessing your sins to the Lord, calling out to him to save you, the Bible says that God promises if you do that, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a promise, and God cannot break a promise. Isn't that good to know? That God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. He'll never go back on his, on his promise. And so you can have assurance. One of the songs that I've enjoyed uh, getting to know recently over the past uh, three or four years is a song about faith. And sometimes our faith uh, is a little bit, we, we falter in our faith. And sometimes it feels like my faith uh, isn't as strong as it should be. This song talks about when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. We're talking about assurance, having this sense, this confidence that that God, we we belong to God, that we're going to heaven. But we also need to rest in the fact that Jesus, if our faith is genuinely in him, he's holding us tightly. When the tempter would prevail, Jesus will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. Though my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. I love that. Faith is how we, for lack of a better term, get a hold of Jesus. But we have to remember he's got a, he's got a hold of me. He's got a hold of you. And he's got a tight grip. And he's not, he's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. The final thing I'll say this morning, I think it's really important if you're struggling with assurance. Our salvation isn't based on our sense of assurance. Your salvation is not based on your confidence level. Because sometimes your confidence can be really high. Yes, I'm I'm on my way to heaven. I have this strong sense of assurance. And sometimes it can be really low. But your salvation is not based on your confidence level in this moment. Your salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross... So if your trust genuinely is in Jesus, your salvation is secure. Isn't that good to know today? So this is a little bit different, but if, as we close the service in just a few minutes, I want to ask Jordan if we could to sing Blessed Assurance. And if you're struggling with assurance, it might take a little bit of courage for you to stand, you know, to to come out and, and come forward to pray. But if you're struggling with assurance or don't know for sure that you're a Christian and you'd like for some of us to pray with you, this would be a great time to nail to nail that down. Okay? Let's pray, and then Jordan's going to lead us in that first hymn, Blessed Assurance. And I want to invite you to come if you need prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had in your, your word, and I pray that your Holy Spirit now would take it and apply it to our hearts. If there is anyone here that struggles with a sense of your love and favor, I pray in these moments you would deliver them from that and set them free and give them in their hearts a peace that passes all understanding of your goodness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing this together?